comes out in the church, I'll know who I'll ask to preach. <laughs> and you'd probably do a good job. First, let us, uh, let me, before we pray, let me give an update about Father Michael. Uh, for those who aren't on the uh, parish flock note um, set up, uh, Father Michael has been in the hospital this week. Um, talked to him this morning, talked to him this afternoon. It's all going great. Uh, he had a problem with low blood pressure, low blood sugar, uh, and then uh, also terrible retention of fluid. So anyway, they're adjusting all of his meds to deal with the low blood pressure, uh, doing a little coaching on his blood sugar. Um, then uh, in addition to that, um, I, when I talked to him this morning, the nurse happened to be in the room and I said, uh, how much fluid have they taken off you? And he said, and then he stopped and he said, uh, ma'am, how much fluid have y'all taken off? And I heard her say in the background, three pounds of fluid and that's just that's less than about eight hours so uh, he'll probably be there I'm thinking uh, through tomorrow and then hopefully uh, they'll release him on Saturday but as you know as long as the beer tap keeps putting out fluid uh, <laughs> you know he'll be there at the hospital but he's very chipper he's doing great um, and like any of us there's you know when you're not feeling good you're kind of happy to go and they start taking care of you and then you start feeling really good and you're ready to leave so uh Anyway, he, uh, if you don't see him for the next two weeks, please don't worry. He was due to go on vacation on Sunday anyway, so he couldn't have timed this much better. Uh, so anyway, and provided all goes well, he gets out in a timely manner, he intends to still go down and visit his family. With that said, let us begin in prayer. We can pray for him and pray for all of us. Well, God, our Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather and to celebrate your church. Give you thanks for the opportunity to celebrate as a people of God and as citizens of Franklin. We ask you to bless us this evening, to bless Margie, and to help us more appreciate our parish, but also for our guests, so they may too know our place in the city of Franklin. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and continue to bless this parish for the next 150 years. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. P.S. Take care of Father Michael. Um, uh, first, I'm not going to do an extended introduction, uh, but just to say, uh, most of our parishioners, you're well aware of who Margie is, Margie Fesson. But as she begins to speak, I want to point out that Louise Volpe, uh, I don't know if she's exactly our oldest parishioner, but man, she's in the running. Uh, <laughs> and as my grandmother would say she still has all of her marbles. Uh, and so uh, in terms of parish facts and dates at a certain point, uh, her purpose tonight is to fact check Margie. <laughs> but also I want to welcome back to us uh, our presenter from last month who gave a wonderful presentation of the history of the churches in downtown Franklin, uh, Rick Warwick. We want to welcome him back as well. And his chaperone and the one to make sure he behaves sitting next to him is Father Bala. <laughs> you know, Margie and I talk more and more and more. Um, when I first came, we were starting to talk about the 150th. She popped in my office and said, I just want to introduce myself. And she said, I'm Margie Thess. And oh, I was all excited uh, to meet her because I've seen her books, heard a lot about her. Um, you know, knew that she started the company that does all the walking tours downtown, which she has since sold. Uh, I knew she had uh, a book over at Landmark, uh, Haunted Franklin, I think that's the title of it. Uh, I told everybody on Sunday, if you want to know anything about Haunted Franklin, go buy the book. I really don't want to know much. But, uh, <laughs> now, uh, so I mean, I was aware of her by reputation, and we sat, and she just wanted to pop in and say hello, introduced herself, and two hours later, we were talking about her book about the history of the parish, uh, which she has diligently be, been working on. Uh, so a lot of what she's going to present tonight are things that she's learned and gleaned from that process. Uh, I noticed in the bullet a few other places, our local historian, our parish historian, Margie Thesson, parenthetically, and Father Ed. I'm glad it's parenthetically because she's a pro, I'm an amateur. Uh, and so much of what I know, 
and our own, Margie, uh, who's so, so very accomplished in her own right, uh, early career as an attorney, and now all of the stuff she does here in Franklin. Uh, I just want to give you our own, Margie. be here and I see Father Bala and Rick of course and uh, great to see I'm not gonna I don't shouldn't probably do this but it's great to yes Mark made it as you can see <laughs> we've been pretty worried about him but he's doing great um, and um, who oh gosh these names I can only remember names if you're dead so if, if <laughs> so if if I remember your name watch out check your pulse God, it's just terrible. John Sturgeon. <laughs> John, where are you? There he is, back there, yeah. John was a, is a, is a longtime member of the church, but they have moved to Murfreesboro because they have a certain grandchild over there, which I guess we'll let, forgive them for that. But John knows an awful lot. I was just talking to him, and we'll continue to. So, yeah, I actually started working on this book about 10 years ago, Father Bala, suggested it and honestly I just never I was busy working and it just never really got off the ground and then when I heard about Father Ed wanting to do something for the 150th I did like he said I just popped in and I was not going to do it I said I'll you know I've done some work I've done some research a little bit of writing on it but I'm really I just don't think I have it in me to do the book for the 150th two hours later yeah sure of course I'd be happy to it'd be great <laughs> Yeah, anything for you. So here we are. And that was when? Last year or sometime, I guess. Yeah, it must have been maybe even in the summer. I don't know. But you know what? Um, so you do research, and then you get research. Father Ed, don't listen to him. He's a pro. He's a great researcher. So I'm getting all these emails with all of this new information. Brian Laster, who is the, the editor of the uh, Williamson County Historical Journey Journal, taking over after Rick. How many years did you have it? 30 years or something. Brian sent me things. and But we do need a... Sometimes. But it's... So I decided instead of just Louise is here, I'm not going to give you a lot of dates. But you know, I learned a lot. Do ten things that I didn't know about St. Philip. Well, you can see what happened. It expanded into eleven, and we even have extra credit. So it's really twelve. Know that in the not the official name I just learned from Father Ed, but it's the name that the church should be on the documents, that kinds of thing, the legal the name Philip, that it wasn't one of. I knew that's who it was, that it was an apostle, but I'd never thought that it was St. Philip the Apostle of Catholic Church. It's on the sign now, it's pretty official. And so a couple of weeks ago, I came in and talked to Kim, and I said, just asking, I'm not really like, why all of a sudden are we calling it that? She said, because it's on the front of the church. I said, well, I know, I saw the sign. Yeah, I, I saw it. I, she said, no, the old church. I'm like, what? What do you mean it's on the front of the old church? I've looked at that church how many times? I've taken pictures of it. She said, well, let's go. So out we toddle out there. There's Kim in the back. Um, and she said, see, it says it right there. OK, let's see how well this is. OK, so there's the church. See over the, the light hanging down there? That's that little, that little sign there. What does that say? It says D-O-M. OK, I got to tell you again, I forget what that I did a screenshot, hold on. D-O-M is initials. It stands for Deo Optimo Maximo. It means, what does that mean, Deo? 
who, come on, some of you took Latin. Some of you are old enough to remember Latin mass. God, right? The greatest God is the greatest or the greatest God. Pronouncing it like Italian. the invocation of Philippi or Philippi what Philippi is that how it's pronounced I don't know um, but anyway so that's there it is I, honest honest how many of you had ever noticed that raise your hand if you noticed it one? You noticed it? Today is the first day you noticed it? I said, how many of you have noticed it in the past? You, you never noticed it? Me neither. Okay, I feel better. I'm not the only one. What? No, it does. Philippi. Well, I guess that must have been the Latin spelling of Philippi. Philippi, yeah, I guess. The Latin spelling, yeah, yeah. But as we all know, does Phil So I will tell you, looking back, historic, and also you always saw St. Philip's Church with do it. And Father Ed said, at St. Philip's Church because there is only one. Right? What year was the church built? 1843. <laughs> you're, two for, you're two for two. It wasn't 1871. You might think, what? Sure it was. No, it wasn't. It was built in 18, oh wait, 1868. And this is thanks to Rick or Brian. I can't remember. Who was it? Did you find it originally? Yeah, Rick is the culprit here. So Rick found evidence of a lawsuit. Sounds bad, doesn't it? that was filed by, in the court here in Franklin, by a brick maker that was located down on five points, and it was against the Bishop of Nashville. It was for bricks supplied and labor to build the Catholic Church in that place. <laughs> and um, the date, 1868. So, I'm going to break some hearts here, but we've always said it's just the tradition of the church that when they tore the rectory down, 1975, something like that, which was right here where we are, the rectory was torn down, they uncovered the location of the brick kiln, and they found these bricks. And what did they do with the bricks, some of these leftover bricks? They put them in the shape of a cross out there on the sidewalk. And that was till about 2015. Then it was removed because it was a trip hazard. But the bricks were taken and dumped behind the door back here. Okay. So Rick and Brian said, we think that was the brick kiln for the Masonic Lodge. Okay. Okay, so I thought, well, we still have some of those bricks. So I'm going to take the bricks and do a little visual comparison. So I took a brick and I went took it and went over to the church on the inside, of course, and compared it. And I thought, hmm, I don't know. It doesn't really look like the same brick to me. <sighs> then I went over to the Masonic Lodge. Now, the Masonic Lodge was built in stages, so I knew where to go. And to me, it looked like an absolute perfect match. <laughs> well, then I told Kim about it at the same time we were here. And she said, well, let's go, let's go do it again. So we got a different brick, because I still have that brick somewhere in my garage. I will bring it back. And we looked, and I will say it looked closer. And then we went over there, and it didn't look as close. So the jury's out, but I think the evidence of 
the lawsuit where they said they supplied bricks and labor. I mean, think about when you build a church, what else do you have to do? It's not like you, they're not, they weren't wiring it or plumbing it or anything. Basically, you just lay some bricks. Plus, the Irish people who founded the church, they weren't bricklayers. Well, you think, okay, maybe they just learned how. But they were railroad workers. So anyway, I don't know. What do you all think about that? It sounds like to me. Woo. Well, Oh, no. Well, there was never any... F it, oh, I forgot to tell you this part. So, it used to be, I don't know if you know this, but it used to be that all the property of the church in the diocese was held by the bishop, in the bishop's name. And so, when you had a new bishop, they had to go through all these transactions to get it to the new bishop. And so, they were filing this suit, asking the, ca the court for a declaratory judgment, that takes me back, asking the court to tell to have the court determine who the, the successor was. Well, what they didn't know is the they had already done that. And so, and then it just was over. So apparently, I don't know if it got the attention of the bishop and they paid it, that's happened another time, um, but it, it all went away and all is well. And I think we're in pretty good shape still. So <laughs> I don't think we have to worry. The statute of limitations is run, okay. So um, now here's another one, and this is what I was talking to John Sturgeon about. What are some of the places CCD classes have been held over the years? Where? What? Number one, the Masonic Lodge. He said, not the Masonic Temple. John Sturgeon said the same thing. I think it was right before he got here. I found in the records a list of all the places that they were having CCD classes. The church was bursting at the seams. When the church just was completely adequate for about 80 years, and then all of a sudden growth came, and they couldn't build fast enough. John talked about how they were in the first day of one of the new building plans for the church. Was it over here, did you think? Yeah, there was an old shed over there, an old metal shed, and then and then they built the new church. And he said the first, day, <laughs> the first 11 o'clock Sunday mass, he walked in and counted 58 people standing. So already it was too small. And they just didn't have places for CCD. So they asked the Masons. And I have to say the Masons have always been very open. In 1871 when the church was donated, that was used for like a reception. And then in 1971, when the church was celebrating its centennial, that was where the overflow was, because they were still in that little tiny church, and the bishop came out, it was a big thing, you know, just like the 150th, but they had no room, and so that's where they had it. So obviously that would be the first place you'd go, is right next door to the Masonic Lodge and have classes. So then, that wasn't enough, so then they went to Harpeth Academy. Harpeth Academy is the old lower BGA right up here, and that was easy, you could just, Kids just walk up there Sunday morning. And then here was another location, Harpeth National Bank. Now, Harpeth National Bank was originally located at 4th and Main. And that building today is a clothing store called Emmeline. You remember Pig and Peach and what's that other ice cream, Ben and Jerry's? But they moved about 74. And so I'm not sure if they were here or if they were at their new building. And that's this building. Everybody remembers this. Rick was not complimentary of the design team at Harpeth National Bank. <laughs> Y'all remember this? Do you, I don't know when they, it's the building on the square that's First Horizon Bank. And they, up, they, you know, they took it down basically just to the structure and then they, they did it. So anyway, so it was, may have been both. It's not, not really clear from the records. And then they also um, said they stuffed classes in every room in the rectory. This is the rectory where we're standing here. There was a period of time that the priest was living in, a, in an apartment, the executive house apartments out on Hillsborough Road. And a parishioner paid for it. They said, we just need the space in the rectory to use for the church. We got to get you someplace else. So yeah, 
<laughs> there. So, and then, and then they said, and we even had to bring on to the property something that looked like this. Now, what I'm going to show you wasn't the actual, because nobody took a picture. They probably didn't want to remember in the future, but this, an old house trailer. That's what it was described as, an old house trailer. I would love to, does anybody remember where it was? And it might have been briefly, you know, it was, they said an old house trailer. I'm thinking kind of like a uh, portable classroom, but that's not what they called it. They called it an old house trail trailer. <laughs> it's nice. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. This one, I could have found worse ones on the internet, but, and then they, then they had then the biggest plan, and this one was really a go, but unfortunately, the bishop said no, because they were going to have to be driven, and that was they were going to go to Franklin High School. <laughs> and this is an old picture before they did all the updating of Franklin High, and that was pretty disappointing that they weren't able to use that because that would have had everybody in one place instead of, I mean, literally it was like the first grade went to Harpeth Academy, second grade went to their, you know, Masonic Lodge, third and fourth went to, they were just all over town. So anyhow, okay, so now, pardon? Say that again. I would say about 72 or 70 to 374. <laughs> Louise, who invited you? Okay, I will show you. I will show you in the scrapbook that the Council of Catholic Women did that describes that. Right. Yeah. But they had all the list in the scrapbook that said, this class goes to this place, this class goes to that place. I'll show it to you. I have it. <laughs> Trust me, people. Okay. So um, now this one it doesn't have anything to do with St. Philip, sort of in a way. Yo. What about the what? Yeah, the Malloy House. I forgot that. But by that time, that was part of the church. Yeah, I was going to put that in. There was a house next door to the church called the Malloy House. The church had owned the property. Then they sold it to this family named Shay. And then um, the Shays gave it to their daughter who married a Malloy. And these are like the early names, Shays and Malloys and all that. And um, then they ended up getting it back. They bought it back. And they did have classes and that kind of thing in there. Say that again. Yeah, I know, I gotta add that, then we'll have so many more places that Louise can tell us we never did. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Louise. Okay, what famous Catholic was related to the first governor of Tennessee, John Sevier? Famous Catholic. Nobody knows this. No. <laughs> Who is the guy on the left? Can anybody tell? Who? St. Francis Xavier. Does that kind of make sense, right? So there are people who disagree with this. I've seen that, but I've also seen several sources that say they were. They were both from Spain. Severe, John Severe, who was the first governor of Tennessee, was from, his name had been changed from Xavier to Severe was anglicized. Although, anyway, that's what they call it. Sounds more French to me, but it was supposed to be sound fit in better, I don't know. But John, anyway, they were 200 years apart, but it still I thought was an interesting little factoid. And then I discovered in the, um, one of those wonderful scrapbooks that John Sevier was also a St. Philip parishioner. He was head of the education thing. Do you see that? Do y'all remember them? I don't, I never knew them. Yeah. Oh, they're still alive? I wonder if they are related to the John Sevier, who was the gov first governor of Tennessee. No telling. You think what? They probably were. I figure they probably It's not a common name. Plus, it was a name that was, that was changed. And one thing you have to learn when you do historic research, if you ever do it, people change the spelling of their names all the time. For example, here we have Riley's, and on the w stained glass window, the Riley is R-I-L-E-Y, but most of the time you see it as R-E-I-L-L-Y. 
I don't know. In my own family, they did that. Not really sure. Okay, um, let's see. So here's one. This is one, the name, the original name of the bank. It does look familiar, right? The um, first Franklin Federal Savings and Loan. So that was, I could have asked Rick, but I went to Facebook to get the answer, the Franklin page. <laughs> It was a, one of those savings and loans, and then it changed to Metropolitan something. I don't know if you remember the savings and loan meltdown, late 80s, Resolution Trust, the government agency that had to try to fix everything. And so they went under. Well, union planners then bought it, and then we bought it from union planners. But union planners, that was really sort of just a caretaker of it. But they, um, the building just sat over there empty for a long time. And I remember Father Arnold was like, I want that building. It's just, we need that building. We could really use that property. It had the lot behind it. And of course, this is just all this, this, this the narthex of the church is uh, what, what was um, the, you know, that's what's left in the two little wings you can't really see. But um, eventually Father Arnold was put in contact with somebody who knew somebody. And I think Mark, my husband, had something to do with that, <laughs> to, who to contact, because he just couldn't get anybody. It was, now it was a government asset, so they didn't care. And so there it sat. So finally, he was able to get it and, and talk to them and said, yeah, let's, let's talk about the price. And I don't know all the ins and outs, but all I know is that he just signed the contract. And um, well, that was a multi-million dollar contract. Yeah, I suppose you could sign a contract to get a new phone system in your church, but to buy this big piece of property. And uh, Father Ed might be able to help me out with this, but we had, had Bishop Niedergazes. Niedergazes. And I'm thinking he was kind of laissez-faire about some things. Where is Father Ed? Did he leave? There you are. Was he kind of laissez-faire about some things? Oh, not his advisors. Oh, okay. So, well, I guess maybe Father Arnold thought that it could just sort of slip by. <laughs> the new bishop, Bishop Kimmick, who came down from Buffalo, and buddy, let me tell you, there was a new sheriff in town. <laughs> so when Bishop Kimmick found out that Father Arnold had signed the contract to buy that property and... It, it, like, you did what? <laughs> so, anyway, so, but it was too late. He'd signed the contract, and then he came up with a big funding plan, and I guess Jim Sokol's not here, because wasn't Jim in charge of that? Jumped right in on that. I liked my joke here. What was the name of the fundraising campaign for the main church? And it is saying that Father Arnold coined the phrase, the worst pun of the night, probably. <laughs> So yes, it was called Banking on Faith, and there's good old Father Arnold right there. <laughs> He's tough, <laughs> right? So Banking on Faith, and we all got a lot of visits at the, and got it, but it was, it was great. It was, church was done in 97, and I think it was great that we got it before the boom. I mean, I can't imagine what all this property would be worth right now, because it's all crazy. There's a house down the street that's about 700 square feet that sold for $2.2 million last year. So let's all sell it and split it. What do you say? Okay, now this is going to seem a little odd, and you might guess from the fact that I'm asking the question. Did a St. Philip parishioner try to kidnap German Kaiser Wilhelm II after World War I? Yes, one did. Okay, this is a long story. But I, I won't tell you the whole thing, but I will say the man's name was Dan Riley. And Dan Riley was a local guy, one of those Rileys. And when the war broke out, or when, not when the war broke out, when the U.S. got involved in World War I, he was the first person in Williamson County to enlist in the Army. So he joined an all-Tennessee regiment that was led by a, a very prominent, famous, well-known um, man from Nashville named Colonel Luke Lee, who happens to be or was the grandfather of Sally Nance and Elizabeth Crockett. <laughs> I know. So 
<laughs> That's right. So um, the war finally ends in the U.S. and they, the, Dan, obviously Dan Riley survived it and Luke Lee, and they were sitting around waiting for orders to come back home and kind of bored and, and um, President Wilson was in Paris talking about the peace treaty and um, but they had let this Kaiser Wilhelm, I gotta show you his picture, don't I? This guy. Um, they had let him go into exile in the Netherlands. The Netherlands had been neutral in World War I, and he was staying with some friend, probably relative, at a castle. And uh, Colonel Lee was mad because he thought this, this, he has just caused this terrible uh, loss, you know, bloodshed and proper, you know, just this terrible devastation in Europe and he's getting off scot-free. They thought he should be, there were people who thought he should be tried as a war criminal. So, again, nothing to do. You're in, I think they were, they were in Luxembourg. So he decided he was going to go try to kidnap the, the Kaiser, Luke Lee, and, uh, and he said he was going to give him a free ride to Paris and present him to President Wilson as a Christmas present. So, so he's got to get his, he's got to get the best team he can. He gets together a team of uh, six and then seven, eight people. You can see him right there. Dan Riley is up on the far left and Colonel Lee is second from left sitting. You can tell he's in charge. So they make all these plans. And Colonel Lee has been a senator. He has a lot of connections. And, but basically, they're going to go commit a crime. I mean, that's what they're going to do. And it would cause an international incident, too. But they go, they get a car. And back then, cars are not as reliable as they are now. So they had to get somebody who knew a lot about cars. And who better than, Senator, than um, Sergeant Dan Riley? Dan Riley was a car guy. He had worked for a car dealership. In, here in Franklin, J.M. King on the square. And so he, him and some other people, in fact, it was three guys from Franklin, Dan Riley, Tom Henderson, and somebody else, and then three from Nashville, including a man named uh, Larry McPhail, or Lee McPhail. Does that name ring a bell to anybody? Baseball. Baseball, that's the guy. He had come to Nashville to run a furniture store, or a clothing store, and then he ended up, yeah, he, he was, he was the baseball. He owned the, owned the Yankees for a while. That, that little team, and the Dodgers. So the eight of them, or six of them, they have two cars, they take off, and they go to, they go, first they go through Belgium, and then they've got to, you know, you have to cross borders, there's no EU back then, and finally they get into the Netherlands, and they get to the castle, and they talk their way in. Now, Dan Riley is left in the car, but um, Colonel Lee and Lee McPhail and, and Tom, Captain Tom Henderson, the guy from Franklin, they go in and they say they get one room away. They know that he's in the next room and they tell him, we need to speak to him and they made something up. I, w I will say they didn't really make something up because of what Colonel Lee said later. And they kept saying that they had come, they were just needed to talk to him, but then they were gonna spirit him away. But finally, somebody asked Lee, the, the, the count or whoever he was, asked Lee, he said, are you on assignment the authority of the U.S. government. And he said, I would not lie about it. I just wouldn't tell that lie. So they just turned around and hightailed it out. But on the way, McPhail stole an ashtray. And that, <laughs> yeah, and that caused a big thing. Really, that caused almost a bigger thing than the attempted kidnapping. But they ended up back in, back, you know, in Luxembourg. And, and they talked about court martials, but nobody wanted to do it. Nobody was going to do it at that point. Why would you want to, you know? And so it just sort of died down. But boy, that story had legs, I'm telling you. Um, and maybe because Colonel Lee owned the Tennessean, <laughs> there was got a lot of play in the Tennessean. And, you know, and then life goes on and everybody goes on with their life. And Dan Riley comes back here and he, you know, lives until 1953. He dies, he's 64 years old when he dies in 19... 53. His obituary was printed in newspapers all over the country. I mean to tell you, newspapers in Scranton, Pennsylvania, in um, obviously the Tennessee and, you know, in the banner, the, the local newspapers, but a paper in Washington, in Spokane, Washington, all about this one incident that took place you know, years and years before. In fact, the Tennessean even wrote a, um, 
a editorial, not just a, um, it wasn't just uh, an obituary, although they did that too, but they wrote this um, editorial, I have to read it to you. Mr. Dan Riley of Franklin, whose death has just occurred, was one of a sm the small band of soldiers who won fame through failure in the hectic days of World War I and its aftermath. He was a member of the small band of Tennesseans who slipped over the border into Holland with the avowed purpose of kidnapping Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, interned in that country to which he had fled for refuge. What these adventurous soldiers would have done with their captive if the plans had succeeded has always been a matter of speculation, but they had a big idea and almost carried it off. Finally, however, they rushed back over the border, closely pursued by Dutchmen in uniform. This expedition was but the climax to Mr. Riley's fine war record as first, first sergeant in the 114th Field Artillery, and it was followed by less exciting years in employment of the state and private business. Now the end has come at the age of 64, and he will be remembered as one who fought well for his country and almost landed the Kaiser in person as a souvenir of the war. <laughs> that great? <laughs> I just love that. So um, he got his 15 minutes of fame, can we say. Okay, let's see. Now we're going to talk about which priest served the longest. Yeah, Father Arnold. He's, he got that going away, let me tell you. Nobody was even close. Nobody was even close. You, <clears throat> reading back through the records, oh, my gosh. Every you know, couple of years, they and back when it was the, when the when it wasn't a parish, but it was a mission, they would have like the Franklin Bellevue Mission, the Franklin Columbia uh, Pulaski Mission. So that means that priest has to serve all of those churches. Fortunately, there was a train, but it wasn't always that that convenient. And finally, one of the priests said, "I'm getting a car," but the roads were bad. There was a priest who served Franklin and Murfreesboro in the late 40s. And he said that the road, Murfreesboro, it was tough getting back and forth on Sunday. He said Murfreesboro Road was um, not as good as it is today, which <laughs> it, it, it wasn't, yeah, it was just like a windy, terrible road. It probably took a good hour, more than an hour to get over there. So, um, and I'm thinking that I number probably who served the second longest was probably Father Bala. I think so. Yeah, because, yeah, because most of them, now we do like six years, it seems like, but a lot of times it was, you know, two or three years, and it was, it was they, they would bring in these, these um, like, precious blood priests came, and they served a bunch in the, before it became a, a, um, a parish when it was just a mission back between the time it was built or dedicated and um, 1898 when it became a parish. But, and I assume that when it became a parish in 1898, it stayed a parish, oh my gosh, no. The church seemed like it was doing pretty well at the dedication, or the, excuse me, the 50th anniversary was 1921, right? And um, several members of the church bought stained glass for the church. 20 years later, there was a priest who was assigned here, and the bishop asked him for an account of what Franklin was like, or what the, what, what the prospects were for the church, and oh my gosh, it is the most depressing thing. I mean, he talks about how everybody's poor, people have houses, they're too big, they can't afford to live in them, they can't afford to sell them, so they usually take in boarders, and this one family, they were moving to Nashville for work, and that was one less family, and that depression really took it out of him. And so it just went from just a few years, you know, from, well, I think I was, things were kind of picking up to um, thinking they weren't even sure they could keep it going. So, and then after World War II, that all changed. Okay, so who, this is a hard one, I don't think anybody's gonna get this, who was employed at the church for the longest and why was she called the White Tornado? <laughs> <laughs> okay, again, it's those scrapbooks. This was a scrapbook, I think from 1972. That, <laughs> that's Louise. That is Louise. And she has got a mop bucket. 
and I, were, I cut this off, but it said 3 a.m., 12, 20, 31, 72, but it should have been 1, 1, 73, or whatever the year was. So they had had a big New Year's Eve party, and when they took the pictures and put them in the scrapbook, that, there was Louise. Yeah. I know. Yeah, you did. I tell you what. They, she said, we had a lot of parties. I know you did. So I wondered, I thought, the white tornado. Well, I remember back to my you know, youth in the 60s that there was a, I told Mark, I said, I think there was something called the white tornado. And sure enough, I found it. Cleans like a white tornado. So um, anyway, that's, that's all Louise. Louise, what year did you start and what year did you finish? Yeah. What year, 71? Okay. And no, um, 2000. I can't do the math. So, and then weren't there periods of time that it was just you and Father Arnold? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, that was Louise. Yeah. Oh, at first. <laughs> yeah, you did. Right, <laughs> three in the morning. <laughs> she had her mouth back at. <clears throat> yeah, she did. Okay, now the next one. Who has been a parish member the longest? No, Daisy. Daisy Bronton Murray. They, yeah, that's a, see, that's one thing that's different about our church. Like if you take maybe like in Franklin, the Methodist church, the traditional mainline churches or the Presbyterian church, you have a lot of people who go back eight, nine, ten generations. We just don't do that. So, Philip Drone was, yeah, I did check with him. He was another one. He was young. She was, I think, maybe mid-50s when her family joined the church. And I, is her mother still alive? Her, does anybody know? Because her mother, but I don't even have a picture. I can't even think of her name, to tell you the truth. So, yeah, Miss Lily, that's right. Yeah. Is she still alive? Wrong picture. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. So really, this family came in 50s, mid, I think mid 50s. So Philip Drone, I don't think was that early because he's a, he was born, I think we're the same age. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but <laughs> 55, born in 55. And he, he was a few years before he join. So I know. Okay. Now, one more question and then a special. Then we have a, what did I say? Extra credit. But this is number 11. Why did eight train carloads of Nashville Catholics come to Franklin to ransack the town? <laughs> you might wonder that, right? Does anybody know? Yes, it was the dedication. Boy, we got a This is a newspaper called The Union and American. And it has a very long story about the dedication of the church on November, um, no, no, 1871. So November, it was on November 6th. And the story talked about that, that it was eight car loads, train car loads. And of course, they're right down there. So they just come up to church. One of the groups was called the St. Joseph's Total Abstinence Society. <laughs> so what do you think that meant? <laughs> they were Irish Catholics. They were all Irish Catholics. So what do you suppose that meant? Alcohol. It was alcohol. They, there were also like temperance. That was all had to do like the women. Remember the maybe you've heard of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. So 
Prohibition did not start, it started in 1920, right? Lasted 14 years, national prohibition. But all of that movement towards prohibition, you know, we look back on it today and say, well, how stupid they ever thought that would work. But that had been building for years, for decades. And there were lots of states, like Tennessee was dry. If you were wet, you allowed alcohol. If you were dry, you didn't. So Tennessee had gone dry before national prohibition, and they were talking about it. So why was it such a problem? I'll tell you. It was really as a result of the Industrial Revolution. For the first time, the average working person had money. They worked in a factory, and they got cash. They got paid on Friday, and what did they do? They went to the saloon. Men, I'm looking at you. And they drank up, they drank up the paycheck. And so it was causing terrible, terrible problems for women and children. There was a lot more domestic violence and just hunger. So it became, you know, many churches. Franklin had several temperance organizations, and I know we laugh about the Irish, but they were, you know, they, that's who was in this. And so, um, and that was, you know, that was way, that was 50 years before Prohibition. So lots of groups came, and um, they had mass, and there was a very nice lady who lived next door, across the street, the Cliffs, this Cliff family lived across the street. They were not Catholic, but they lived in a house that was moved down the street, but the, their, Dr. Cliff was a physician, and his um, office is the little tiny building there on Main Street. It's hard to believe that was a doctor's office, but it was for years. And they actually um, contributed, it says, uh, Dr. Cliff and his amiable lady contributed liberally toward the pleasures of the trip. And further, we hear that Mrs. Cliff furnished all the ornaments for the altar, vases, flowers, etc., besides chairs for the sanctuary. And there was somebody who came, Mr. Tim Sheehan, he had been a citizen of Franklin for 20 years and accumulating a snug little fortune. May he live long to enjoy it. He was a, uh, he had served in, he'd been at the Battle of Waterloo. It's hard to believe. Um, but what about this ransacking business? Well, after all of the services, the mass, everything was over, they said, this article said, the hunt for refreshments now commenced, and all Franklin was ransacked for dinners. <laughs> so I just, I just love the, uh, the terminology of the time. There was no criminal activity, thankfully. And uh, it was a lot of people. I mean, it's eight carloads. It had to be several hundred people. And it says that um, somebody who had been from Nashville fed a, small, fed a small multitude and several other citizens dispensed their hospitalities to all comers. The hotels were eaten out and temporary refreshment stands did a flour flourishing business. So it was a big thing. So that's why they came to ransack the town. 1871. Yeah. So remember I said how the church was built in 1868? But, and we don't know why, for some reason, it was not dedicated until 1871. So it couldn't be used when it wasn't dedicated by the, the bishop. Maybe he was busy. I don't know. That, well, I wonder why they didn't just go on and do the dedication when they had the building. But it doesn't appear that they did. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, they put a lien on it or something. I don't know. I don't know. So... Um, now, the last question is, it really should just be 12, but, but when Father Ed came um, in 20, the summer of 2020, of course, you know, we're in the middle of the pandemic, and so he, um, why are we celebrating 150 years in 2022 when it's actually 151? So I think you all know the answer to this. Yeah. <laughs> I hoped never to see that again, but there it is. So I'm going to get rid of that because I don't like to look at it either. So yeah, so it was a great idea. And I have to say that starting it instead of ending, you know, we started it on the 150th anniversary and we have a year of activities. But here in Tennessee, we have a proud history of doing things late. I'll tell you one example. It's the the Centennial Exposition. You know, we're West End Avenue in Nashville, Centennial Park, right? Okay. Well, that was one of those World's Fair kind of things. They were doing them everywhere. St. Louis, 
St. Louis had a big one in 1904, I think. Yeah, that was afterwards, but they, that was just a big thing. So they had this big plan to do this big kind of World's Fair kind of thing, and it was supposed to be in 17 or 1896. That's the 100th anniversary of the town, but they had ran into some financial difficulties, so they had to do it the next year. So there we go. We have a better excuse, the pandemic. So, and then one more thing, we have um, Bicentennial Park in Franklin. You know it? So when was the Bicentennial? 1999. When was the park opened? 1912. 2012, so Bicentennial plus 13. Okay, that'll work. <laughs> Who's counting, <laughs> right? So, okay, well, that's the, those were some of the things I learned about this, and there's more when the book comes out. But does anybody have any questions or comments? And I know I've got to get that scrapbook for Louise. Okay. <laughs> Tom, no, you don't really need to. He asked if he could pre-order the book. You don't need to. What's the what? Well, I don't know. I, you know, I was just going to call it kind of dully. I was going to call it, a, you know, St. Philip at 150 years, but I'm thinking, I don't know. You'll know what it is. You'll figure it out. <laughs> But Jeff Carroll, Jeff Carroll's going to do the cover design, so you know it'll look great. So, anybody else? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Who wants to tell her? <laughs> no. What? No, most people would not know <clears throat> what that is. Yeah. The question was, on the historic marker, the other one, about John Eden, it talks about his Peggy, his controversial wife. <laughs> I know, it is. He's right there, right behind you. Oh, no, I can tell you all about it, but I don't know. It, let me just say that he was the Secretary of War, and he'd been a senator. He was a friend of Andrew Jackson. He lived on the spot in, where the church is. And um, he and his wife were involved in a, they were involved with each other um, too soon after she had been widowed. And it, it, it's, it, it's a story called The Pet Petticoat Affair. There was a movie made about it in the 1930s called The Gorgeous Hussy. <laughs> Not kidding. And it's, a, it's fact fictionalized. It isn't just sort of one of those, kind of like this thing. It's kind of like the... Um, the, the kidnapping the, the Kaiser, it's one of those sort of interesting stories, side stories about history that, you know, get kind of lost. But that one, it's, it's a great story. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? Nobody? Well, thank you all for coming out. I sure appreciate it. <laughs> what time we got? All right. Okay. Are we done? We're done, except the pastor has to talk. <laughs> okay. Another little uh, anecdote uh, with the Eaton property, and uh, when you get home or whenever, just, you know, you remember the, the television sitcom, The uh, Petticoat Junction, well, Google Petticoat Affair, and you'll read a lot, but when our um, sprinkler system was put in, our irrigation system, and they were going across the front of the church, they started running into a lot of stone walls, which were part of the, ha the house and the gardens that belonged to Eaton. So all of that's still underground, all out in front of us. Uh, they had to stop work on our irrigation system and bring in uh, a couple archaeologists to say, what is this, before they had permission to drill through the wall to get our irrigation pipes through. Um, Margie could go on and on and on. I was really thrilled uh, to find out, and this is when I knew Rick really knew his stuff. Um, over on the, yeah, right over here on the corner at uh, Church and 202 is what I'm thinking of the house there, the greenhouse. Many of you remember the story of the greenhouse. 
Well, the last true residents of the house were J.D. and Arvilla House. And uh, they joined, they were black, joined St. Philip Church. And uh, so they were the last true inhabitants of the house. And there's a whole history of the greenhouse uh, about the city wanted to tear it down and Thelma uh, and some others, you know, saving the house. Uh, but I was telling Rick, I said, man, I found all this stuff out. And they were parishioners. And Rick said, oh, yeah. And she, was it her brother or his brother? Uh, one of the, oh, yeah, one of the brothers. He joined the church, too. But he never really participated. And when, it, you know, at some point I asked him, I said, what religion are you? He said, well, I guess I'm Catholic. Um, but anyway, so the parish has, there's a real estate office in there now. But if you look at the little house on the corner, it's called the greenhouse because it's painted green, historical house. Uh, and anywhere in Franklin, make sure if you're walking around, take the time to stop and read the historic markers. Uh, the Bucket of Blood neighborhood, I mean, all the kind of stuff that just, I mean, the remi- and, and all that stuff was here when our, when our folks were here. Um, the Malloy House across the street, the Shea House, uh, or the Shays uh, moved to where um, our education building is now. The Haggertys lived where the um, a Cry Like building is. Uh, you know, so, I mean, we've got a lot of, lot of connections, a lot of stuff around here. Uh, what I really enjoyed was reading uh, some articles about J.D. and our Villa House. They had a band, the Patent Leather, Patent Leather Kids was the name of their band. And they played all of the better dances in Nashville. Everybody wanted this group. And they were the only black musical group in the city of Nashville that was allowed to come in the front door. Now, I say that because we all know about the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Well, they went to sing at the Centennial Club, which is the premier women's club in Nashville. So here are the world-renowned Fisk Jubilee singers. And at the Centennial Club, they had to go in the back door through the kitchen. They had to eat in the kitchen. They couldn't eat with with everybody else at the Centennial Club. So, I mean, that says a lot about who J.D. and our Villa House are. They're buried over at the Toussaint Cemetery. Uh, There's some markers there that, you know, historic markers that that talk about their presence. Um, They have some connections to A.N.C. Williams one of the premier black pastors of our area. If you were here last month, you heard uh, Rick talk about them. Uh, So, I mean, there's pieces of our parish everywhere around here. And uh, and it really is, you know, wonderfully well known. Uh, Wonderful to know. Um, No, I do not mind. I'm sorry. I just thought of something. I meant to mention, you know, we, we, there were the, all the Shays and the Malloys, and there were Haggerty's in the church. And we always wondered about Pat and Sharon. And they were, Pat was from Alabama, but they have determined that they had a, um, some connection. The, 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 one of the, you know, the original family. Who we all miss so much. So, Anyway, established relationship between the Dennis and but what we have established is he is a descendant of the Shea family. And, uh, landmark books, uh, landmark booksellers across the street. That was Mr. Shea's Jeremiah Shea's grocery store. Um, now then. Margie talked about he had a house, his daughter got married, she ended up married to Malloy, moved in there. Malloy family, is uh, none of them live here in the parish anymore, but they are all over the city of Nashville. Those descendants are still around. Uh, and of course, we're pleased to have Sharon and representing Pat because, you know, that we've, we've got that long time uh, historical connection. Um, and the history between the, the, the Masons and this parish, I don't think anywhere else in the United States you saw Masons and Catholics get along so well and cooperate so much. Uh, and then conversely, not only did it allow us to use the facility, but as their facility 
unfortunately has sort of dilap become more and more dilapidated. Uh, many, many times we've allowed them to have their parties or meetings and their dances here in this very space. Uh, so it's been a wonderful relationship. The last thing I'll say, because it's right at the hour, um, the very first addition to the church, uh, which is what we now call our activity center down below, and Louise was here at the time. Well, contract, I remember. Right, that was our but they really had space, they outgrew the church. So Father Henrik uh, came up with a design, uh, applied to the bishop for permission to build it. Have all the forty in our original church. This parish was going to raise that kind of money at the time to build what we had. money. He went to. money all contracts to build the church Henrik had done till Father Hendrick but pardon me that would have been Bishop Durek probably either Bishop Adrian or Bishop Durek I'd have to look uh, but back all of the person so they paid for it and then of course the building that was where our education center is now they re relocated there that wasn't enough and it really wasn't the best building in the world so father arnold built this and everybody relocated here then the education center was built and then this wasn't big enough anymore and so he bought the bank, bought the property behind it, and built that building. So, you know, it's hard to believe that since the early days of this place that we're actually in our fifth church. You know, it's unbelievable. And, you know, the truth be told, we do pretty well with our, you know, fitting everybody in to sit, but we've outgrown our facility, really. You know, it's just finding, a, finding space around here is incredible. Miller was pastor. He came up with a plan to relocate the parish. Uh, and he was ready to do it. He asked permission. Now his idea was, you know, where they could rebuild everything, all kinds of space. Kirk was bishop. the economy and all paid out a lot of forbade the building of anything it could not be done or you know we got we had a, initial permission but then everything happened and Bishop Dirk said, no, you can't do it, not unless you have the cash in hand. And who knew? So it was really, a, a, you know, a rebe I don't want to say rebellion, that's too strong of a term. But they really said, no, we don't want to leave where we are. It's a great location, you know, et cetera. So they pretty much said, we're not going to contribute. We're not going to do it. And that just so upset him, he resigned on the spot. 
So, um, Yeah, it was in the anyway, and the and that's but anyway, we could go on and on. If you get Margie talking, me talking, and Rick talking, you know, bring out your sleeping bags and your pillows. So let's close with prayer. And when I say me talking, it's, oh, it's really me asking questions of Margie and Rick. Well, God, our Father, we give you thanks for this evening. And in particular, to bless Father Michael, and even more so to bless the people of Florida. Families that no longer have a place to live. Lord, through the generosity of so many people, may we help the people of Florida. But most of all, Lord, we ask that you bless us and bless our families until we have the opportunity to gather again. We ask all of these things in the name of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Appreciate it.